In the last segment, I talked about the sort of tendency of the Republican Party and, and uh, the idea of the Republican Party to avoid entanglements that would require sort of regulative behavior, regulatory behavior from government. That doesn't mean, and I really want to emphasize this, it doesn't necessarily mean that the activism or all of the activism that had been so much a part of the progressive era had been abandoned. Government still took a role or had a role in seeking to shape events as we saw both in terms of international affairs and I think through things like the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, through, through domestic affairs. But again, it's an, it's an activism that rejects entanglement, that looks to government to regulate everyday life rather than seek sort of voluntary cooperation. That moves us on to the so-called jazz age itself uh, and thinking about uh, what lay behind this era of, of the Republican Party and, and of a sort of post-war cultural uh, experience of, I don't know, questioning tradition, questioning the norms of society, norms that had seemed to, seemed to be in place. And ultimately, that's, that's really what cultural history is all about, right? It's, it's about questioning those things that on the surface seem ever so natural. Categories, definitions, identities. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, but for now I want to focus in on the economics of the 1920s and what changes, what makes the 1920s different or identifies or defines them. In economic terms, one of the key periods occurs really right after the war, and you may have gotten a little bit of this in, in an earlier lecture. But the day after an armistice was signed, ending the actual fighting in World War I, uh, Washington, D.C. residents were unable to place long-distance calls. They were unable to place those calls because the various agencies, the war-related agencies in Washington were so busy calling to cancel government contracts. If you think about the war itself and, and the impact of the federal government, no small part of the impact of government had been through the contracts that were put out to get the materiel to fight the war, part of this larger mobilization. The war ended without warning, really, right? An armistice is signed somewhat unexpectedly. And the wartime boom, this booming economy, uh, massive production, massive credit availability, government contracts all fueling this expansion, this growing kind of expansion of government up and up and up, leading to as much as 15% inflation in 1919 and 1920. 15% inflation, prices, demand goes up for goods. Well, in late 1920, that bubble bursts. High prices just plummet as government contracts and government money is pulled out of the economy. Those temporary forces that existed during the war disappear. 1920, 1921, uh, the gross national product declines by some 10%. That's one of those older sort of models, uh, statistical, statistical figures by which to measure economic growth, gross national product. There are 100,000 bankruptcies, um, over 400,000 farms are lost, and some 5 million jobs. So very rapidly after the war, we go from boom to bust. And I'm going to make a point here that's going to come back to haunt us just a little bit later. But that point is simply that the United States economy, at least certain sectors of the economy, never fully recover in terms of prices, um, in terms of productivity, never fully recover in the course of the 1920s leading up to the Great Depression. And yet, by and large, the 1920s on the surface seemed to be a real era, a real decade of affluence. 
The 19, by 1923, by the time you know, Harding's scandals are beginning to break, the economy seems to be recovering. And while the boom and bust had been frightening, given all the pro-business policies of the 1920s, the limited regulation, it doesn't take long for the economy, not all sectors, but generally for the economy, to begin to kind of hum along again. And I think there's an interesting tie here. I'm talking about the economy, and I'm getting ready to, to talk about technology. But when we think jazz age, we think about culture. What's the relationship between culture, on the one hand, and technology on the other? Which drives which? Does technological change alter the way we live socially? Does it alter our ideas about how we think about the world? That, of course, culture. Or do our ideas, which are cultural, do the, does the way our society works, does that open the door for technological change? It's one of the questions that I think academics wrestle with quite a lot nowadays. What leads to what? And you may be arguing, well, that's kind of a chicken or egg question, and maybe it is. But I also think it's rather a fascinating question. Culture is all about what we take for granted. You could argue technology comes along that changes that. But you could also argue that technology doesn't simply emerge from a vacuum. It emerges from a world in which certain ideas are predominant, in which certain ways of thinking about the world dominate. Well, I'm not going to be able, of course, to answer that question here and possibly ever. But technology does play a role in this 1920s economy. One of the things we see happening, and it may seem minor on its surface, but it's actually quite huge, is that America's factories during the 1920s, and starts a little in the, into the early 20s, of course, but certainly by the 1920s, America's factories are shifting over to electrical power and the use of electricity to drive machines. This presence of electricity, particular, particularly in urban areas, uh, is also beginning to change the way people live at home. And there you get into culture. I mean, what can I expect of household life? What ought my expectations to be? Part of the reason I say that electricity is really beginning to affect urban life is because of the rapid growth of urban centers in the United States, in part due to the First World War. Uh, one thing to consider, and one thing perhaps that I haven't talked enough about, is the tremendous demographic change that the United States is undergoing uh, in undergoing in the early decades of the 20th century and we'll see during the First World War as vast populations in the United States leave rural areas, particularly say in the South uh, or the Southern United States, to seek opportunity and begin seeking jobs uh, in the North, in the more industrialized cities, places like Cleveland, Ohio, um, Cincinnati, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, they go to find opportunity and they go by the thousands. I mean, it really is one of the most important mass exoduses that you'll see, one of the most important demographic shifts that you'll see. So we have more and more people living in cities, uh, greater demand than perhaps for electricity that's being now used in the factories where people are working, but also it's in the cities where private corporations will have the easiest times providing the service, the utility for electricity, running the wires, running the infrastructure, etc. It's a lot like uh, cable TV was in the later 20th century. Often you could get it in large cities first, in cities and towns, and it was late or later to be made available in some of the remote, most remote rural areas because, in part, it was more costly to extend the network out. That's sort of where uh, satellite found its niche, I suppose. Well, in terms of technology and electricity, the presence of electricity then allows for greater potential for appliances, and especially um, kitchen appliances, appliances um, sort of of a durable nature, and then entertainment, 
machines for, for entertainment purpose. And we'll get to that in, in just a moment. But when I talk about durable goods in particular, I'm talking about refrigerators, uh, washing machines. Many of these items came to the home in this period, the 1920s. Toaster ovens, electric toaster ovens, um, all sorts of different uh, items. I've, I've got a, a picture that I use, a photograph that I use in a lecture. It's actually from an advertisement, and I think it perhaps is from General Electric, but it suggests, or the picture, the image is of a young woman, a young homemaker, who is plugging in her soup tureen to an electric outlet. And the implication is always cultural. It's the woman of the household who is uh, utilizing these new technologies, who will have more leisure, who you're helping, uh, say as a man, if you go out and purchase one of these labor-saving appliances. That tends to be the way these advertisements run. Now, another huge technology that will come into the American home in the 1920s in ever larger numbers, of course, will be the radio. We've already got the phonograph, but now you're introducing the radio. That, too, run off electricity. M amazing technology, and the cultural impact of that technology will be huge. Because now people can begin to get shows and programs from faraway places. People living in uh, rural areas and hills and hollers, they can run those uh, radios off of batteries. They'll be able to hear opera from New York. They'll be able to hear jazz. They'll be able to hear uh, regular shows that connect ever larger portions of the American population uh, to the mass consumption of, of media, the mass consumption of ideas. And really, allows them to know about what appliances are out there and also what new cars are available and what new fashions are available. I want to focus in here, of course, technologically on, on cars just a moment because the 20s is really a, a decade of the automobile. Through the 19 teens, one of the progressive related campaigns was for good roads. Well, by the 1920s, more and more individuals are purchasing and owning automobiles. Uh, the Model T comes to mind uh, as one of the key automobiles of the era, but certainly you're seeing Chevrolets and Oldsmobiles and Cadillacs. And the essential thing is that more and more people will buy. The 1920s auto sales were tremendous. From 8 million automobiles in 1920, to more than 23 million on America's roads in 1930. So uh, just a huge increase and huge demand for materials that the automobile creates. And you see, that's the effect that this new consumer economy, that this new technology and the changing culture creates, that's the effect that this economy has. It not only means you build cars and you build appliances, but it means you'll, you're gonna need people to um, build the parts, to build machines, to build the machines, that you're going to need resources with which to build the cars and the appliances. And so there's this massive, massive ripple effect that will in many sectors of the American economy lead to uh, expansion and money and put people to work.